All right, welcome my friends. Welcome to another exciting science night with a mag lab, with a mag lab, or sorry, the FSU mag lab. I am Miss Casey from the Leroy Collins, or, or Leroy Collins, blah, blah, blah. okay, <laughs> Ooh, here we go. I'm so excited about going viral, oh my gosh. Anyway, all right, so tonight we will be going viral with the mag lab and a bunch of other guests. So strap in, get ready, and here we go, Miss Julia. All right. Hello there. My name is Julia. I'm a researcher at the Mag Lab in Tallahassee. Uh, we do all kind of research, mainly focused around magnets. We build them. Uh, we do research with them. We let other researchers do science with our magnets. Um, and today we want to talk about some of that related to viruses as well, because we do some research in that direction. But also, since it's been so much in our lives these days, we want to talk about viruses and how they affect us. So welcome. We have lots of exciting guests. So let's get going. Okay. All right, before we get going and, um, and start in the actual science, we would like to make sure that everybody's on board properly. So we'll start our first polling session and we'll check out if you can see and hear us okay. And also if you found the chat box, I know some of you already did. The chat box is really important because that is how you can interact with us. This is how you can ask questions, answer questions and talk to us. And also we would like to know how old you are. So if you could let us know how old you are, that would be really exciting and also from where you're joining us, so that we get a little bit of an idea where you guys are sitting and we get to know you guys. All right, 60% of the people already voted. Let's go, let's see if we can get everybody to cast their vote here. Um, so far, everybody can see and hear us, that's a plus. All right, one person hasn't found a chat box yet. All right, so if you look at probably the bottom or somewhere at the edge of the window on the device that you're using, there will be um, maybe three dots that you need to click on where it says more and the chat box might be in there, or you might be able to directly click on the little icon that says chat box. Okay, age-wise, we have uh, six people between four and five, six people between six and seven, eight people between eight, eight and nine, 18 between 10 and 11. Okay, you guys are a majority here, most of that age group, four people between 12 and 14. And I think we also have a couple of adults joining us. That's awesome. Okay. Still some voting. And where are you guys sitting? Okay, some in Tallahassee, a lot in Tallahassee, 87%. Okay, other parts of Florida, three of you. And even outside of Florida, hey, you guys, we're happy you're joining us from far away. That's exciting. Hey, Yulia, we've got a quick question um, that I don't think is in the presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it now. And they want to know who gets to name the viruses. Can yeah. anybody answer that? I actually don't know. My suspicion is it's the person who uh, does a lot of research in it, but maybe our hospital friends would know more about that. Is that right? So yes, generally speaking, it's the people who. Um, My understanding oh. is it's the people who have studied it or isolated it, um, who have who do the research on it that usually get to name it. Yes. Okay, so it's the it's the folks that do the research. There we go. All right, Carlos. I think we can close the poll. All right, um, let's move on. Today we said we were talking about going viral. So we're gonna talk about what a virus is and how we can protect ourselves and our families from a virus. We're also gonna talk about what researchers can do to help understand viruses and how can we protect ourselves from viruses. So we'll have a lot going on and We'll talk to you and you guys will be typing your ideas in the chat box. So what do you guys think? What are viruses? Let's type your ideas in the chat box. What do you guys think? What is a virus? Any idea? So we show you some pictures here. Some are cartoons. 
Some are somewhat more accurate. Germs, okay, I see germs. I see diseases in the chat box. Um, big or global sicknesses around the world. We've heard a lot of that lately. Um, deadly infections that ruin everything, okay. A virus is a disease, corona, okay, germs. So lots of ideas there. So viruses are really actually pretty crazy beasts. They are called, a really funny thing, they're called infectious agents. And they are super duper tiny small. So um, they're actually invisible to plain sight. And just to tell you how small these infectious agents or crazy things are, we brought you a picture that shows a human, which in your age group is probably anywhere between three, four, five feet tall. And then inside the humans, we have our organs. They're already 10 times smaller. Everybody's seen a chicken egg, so they're even smaller. Fruit flies, we're getting smaller and smaller. And then, you know, we get inside the humans, the cells that make us up, our blood cells. And viruses are actually so many times smaller than anything that we can see with our eyes. So we use special devices to look at them. Here actually is a picture of that, of a virus that's been colored in, and it's looked at with a special electron microscope. And later in this, in this uh, night, we will actually hear a lot about imaging and, and looking at, um, at disease uh, things in that way. What else do we have in this? In the, oh, we have a really interesting one. Viruses are non-living cells with DNA that says the cells to duplicate the virus. Wow, that's a really good one. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. We talked about the virus being small and hard to see, but also you said, and our, the person Yasha said, that's a really good thing. Non-living cells with DNA that say that the cells, that, that says that the cells need to duplicate the virus. So what happens? So we say the, the, they need to, they cannot multiply by themselves. They actually need help. So looking at that in more detail, let's say one of you guys or one of us has viral material around them and somebody gets infected with a virus, remember it was an infectious agent, then that person is called a host and only having that host, the virus can actually multiply. So it's a pretty crazy, um, thing such a virus. So in that case, we would say the host is infected. So what happens once we're infected? Does anyone have an idea? What does your body do when you get infected with a virus? I have no idea, but I do have a question. All right, go ahead. So somebody asked about the size of the virus and they want to know if they were as small as atoms. And I do know that they are larger than atoms, but are they smaller than a cell? Actually, let me just go back and have a look at that. I see Sam nodding. Does that mean that's, that viruses are smaller than cells but larger than atoms? So actually, there we go. Because atoms are the things that make us up. They are really our building blocks, um, at least in this realm of things. So viruses are made up of atoms. But then we have, for example, here a human blood cell, which is still about a couple of ten times bigger than a virus. So that's a really good question. Really small, but yeah, there are still smaller things than viruses. All right. Do we have any answers, Carlos, for what your body does when you get infected? A lot of them. Your body tries to fight back. Your immune system fights back. Your white blood cells are sent to defeat the virus. Um, virus duplicates inside your body and gives symptoms of that virus. Um, we get symptoms. So wow. those are some of the answers. That is really good. Yeah, all of that is going on. And we have this really cool thing inside of us, our immune system, our body battles and fights back to get rid of the, to get rid of the um, virus. And that's a really good thing because our bodies that we know to protect themselves. However, sometimes a new virus pops up and our body doesn't really immediately know what to do with it. Um, so in that case, you can get very, very sick. And I think that's what we're seeing around the world right now, that in this family of viruses, maybe some of them we already knew, and then a new family member pops up, and we first have to figure out, our bodies first have to figure out how to deal with that and how to respond to it. And then lots of people 
get really, really sick. All right, that gets us, gets us to uh, another poll session, Carlos, in which we're gonna look into what a virus is. And we have a question for you that is, can you see a virus with your naked eye? And we have another question that says, what does a virus need to multiply? So let's see what you guys think. What is a virus? Those are launched to everybody, so go ahead and give us the answers. They're flying in. Woof. Yeah. What is a virus? So the options here are a disease, an infectious agent, or neither of them. And then we also have, can you see a virus in plain sight? Oh, I think we all agree, mostly agree, that you need a special tool for that. And then also, we have the question, what does a virus need to multiply? A friend another virus or a host all right so most people say a host awesome that is great and what is a virus an infectious agent you guys are awesome i think carlos we can end the poll and um that brings us to how viruses travel and spread so if i think about um traveling uh and moving around I think about my little car, or I like to take a bicycle, or sometimes travel by train, maybe by airplane, but how does a virus get around? Do you guys have any ideas? Type them in the chat box. How does a virus travel? We got a lot of people blaming for how tra viruses travel. Okay. Um, by people, by touching any host on your body, Wow, all right, by contact, I see. People that are infected spread the virus. They jump, okay, breathing into somebody's face, coughing, all right, a lot going on. Yeah, you guys pretty much figured out a lot of them. So yeah, with little droplets in the air, through the air, on objects, like on food, for example, you could eat something that has a virus on them. Or you could, you know, pass something that you've been working with to somebody else. And then some of them are also spread by animals. And I, I guess uh, we are also animals that can be spread in the virus. All right, so viruses travel through the air droplets. And you can imagine that when a virus travels through the air, for example, in the droplets, and gets stuck on, for example, a door handle and you touch it, you could have it in your hands. And that would be um, a way that you could... Um, you could uh, spread the virus further. So just to give you an idea on how that works and how we can really be spreading the virus big time, I have this little cartoon for you guys. So let's say a little science night hero friend uh, gets coughed or sneezed on, and then he gets sick and he's a host for this multiplying virus and he talks to his friend and he sneezes on his friend. And now his friend, goes to talk to his family. And he goes back and talks to his family and they sneeze or pass around uh, objects and they get some of their friends sick. And then everybody goes home to their friends or their soccer team or their family. And all of a sudden, uh, lots and lots of people get a virus. And now imagine we put transportation that we use with that. So us spreading the virus through the air, through objects and whatnot, get on transportation and move around the country or the world, all of a sudden a virus can be all over the place. And that's really what we've been seeing in the past couple of months going on with COVID and Corona. And that brings us to another poll session. Let's see guys, what do you guys think? Can viruses travel on their own? And how do viruses spread and travel? While they're doing that poll, I got a question that I think um, our TMH folks or maybe Sam can answer, and that is how does a virus form? Anyone? That's a tough one. So that's a real good question, and, and viruses form in a lot of different ways. Most of the time, what you need are different types of organic materials to come together and they 
they mutate or they change within cells and then they start to get replicated. And so it's a, a very strange way of uh, putting different kind of building blocks together and it becomes something that um, becomes that infectious agent. Thank you, Sam. All right, let's see how our poll is doing over here. Can viruses travel on their own? Mostly they need help, that's right. And how do viruses spread and travel? Through the air, with droplets, object to object, all of these are right. Um, with humans or animals, or in all of these ways. ways. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys got it right. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Okay, and that brings us to meeting uh, a doctor at TMH and a respiratory therapist at Capital Medical Regional Center. So, uh, Simone, Dr. Simone, did you want to take it from here and tell us a little bit what you guys do at TMH and how you guys have been affected by a really big virus pandemic situation in the past couple of weeks, months, really? Sure. So, I'm Dr. Simone and this is Dr. Angie. Hi. So, we're two doctors at TMH and we take care of patients who have been infected with the virus. And today we're going to show you how we protect ourselves when we're dealing with patients who have um, the coronavirus. And we're going to also show you how you can protect yourselves as well. So we're going to show you how we protect ourselves. So Dr. Angie is going to show you exactly how we actually dress up to take care of these patients. So the first thing you always start with any time before you do anything else you always wash your hands so i'm going to use some hand sanitizer rather than soap and water okay. got to make sure you clean all the all the surfaces and wait till it dries all right so i don't know if you can see my feet so these are shoe covers that she's going to use. So we have a process that we use, and it's a step-by-step -step instruction that we have to do. So first, we put on our shoe covers. And I wore my fancy shoes today. And then you sanitize your hands again. Oh wow! Simone, you got a little bit quiet. Can you speak up a little bit, please? All right. And then you allow it to dry. All right. And you get your. So this is a yellow gown. We have a question about the type of masks that you're going to use. Yeah. So we'll show you the mask as well. So that's coming up. So Dr. Angie is putting on her yellow gown. And having a, a friend help you make sure that you've done it right is always helpful. And she's making sure it's all snug. Yep. And then here comes the fun part that we actually get to put on our mask. So what kind of mask do you guys use? Can you type it in the chat? So Dr. Angie is using a special type of mask and it's called an N95 mask. Somebody can't hear you. Can you guys hear me okay? Could you speak up a little bit? Sure. Right. There is a uh, question that in the chat that asked, do you guys do this all the time or just during COVID? Well, so it depends on, it, it depends. That's the short answer. For all of this year, we put on if we're, if we're seeing any patient that has COVID, but some other viruses and illnesses we use it for too. Okay. All 
try not to get it in your eyeballs. Okay. All right. Fancy, fancy goggles. <laughs> okay. All right. There is a question that says, how is your mask different from the mask that I wore at school? This mask keeps out probably more particles, more things, more germs than, than sun masks. We make sure that it fits really tight and doesn't let any air out. So most of the masks that we wear around, wear at school, wear around the house, down the street, they're not quite as, not quite as um, snug. snug. Right, so that's part of what we do is make sure that it doesn't, you don't get any air coming out like that. Okay. And there we have it. All right, so then I gotta change it all back. I've got a question that um, that came in that I thought I knew the answer to, but I'm not sure. And it has to do with the cap on top. Um, does is the cap to protect you, or is it to protect the patient? A little bit of both, so it keeps my any of my my germs out. But um, so we use these caps uh, in other cases too. Like if we're doing a surgery, it keeps your hair out of a surgical field. Um, but whenever we go to see a patient who has an infection, it's try to, to try to help getting the particles on your hair so that when you go see another patient later, you don't spread those germs to the other patients. Is that mask hard to breathe in? Was that? What Is was that mask hard to breathe in? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. You get used to it, though. And it and it you can still breathe just fine. It doesn't make your oxygen go down or anything like that. But it does get kind of uncomfortable sometimes. One more question: Can you get COVID from hair? I guess just like any other thing that you touch, if you can get it from a door handle or a pen or anything like that, it could be on your hair. And if you touch your hair and touch something else or touch someone else, that's possible. Uh, lots of good questions coming. What what are the scrubs made out of? I don't know. <laughs> I don't actually know. These are, right, these this... are just, um, they're not latex, but these are by trial. The gloves are. Mm -hmm. What the actual gown is made of? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, well, here's a question I, I'm sure you know the answer to. How long do you usually wear an outfit like that for? Um, it really just depends. So um, if I'm seeing someone in our in our office who I think might have COVID uh, or coronavirus, usually about 15 to 20 minutes. Some people who are seeing the patients in the hospital, they might they might wear it longer depending on what what needs what the patient needs and how long you need to spend with the patient. And I'll ask one more question: uh, Is there a special procedure for taking it off? <laughs> We'll do that now. Oh, did you just sanitize your gloved hands? Uh, Simone, we can't hear you if you're behind the laptop. Okay. Oh. <laughs> No, Simone, okay. you've completely dropped off. We don't hear you at all. Sorry, you can't see. I'm taking off the shoe parts. Okay. Great, we can see in here. Okay. So then you have to sanitize your hands between each of these steps so you make sure you don't get germs on, on your clothes underneath. Oh. 
This is kind of my this favorite. This is my favorite part. So then you get to break it. And you get to feel like the Incredible Hulk. I see that someone asked if you disposed of the protective wear. Yes, most of it you do. And is that a special type of garbage or does it go in the usual? Yes, it has to go into a biohazard bag. All right. So the gloves kind of come off with the, with the gown. Now I'm not putting mine in a biohazard bag right now because I just put it on, but the, uh, I see somebody's asking if we reuse the masks. And in some cases, we have used this kind of, reused this kind of mask because they were kind of hard to, uh, hard to come by. Um, so we were sanitizing them and reusing, reusing them. Okay. Do you know how many COVID patients you have at the hospital right now? I think there, I think there were 10 the last time I checked right now. So then these, if we were reusing the goggles, we would sanitize these, or sometimes we have a mask that has a plastic shield that we can throw away. All right. Uh, Anton, can you tell us how many COVID patients you have at your center? Yes, we have about, we have 14 in house today. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken care of over 780 since the pandemic started. Oh, wow. There is a um, there is an interesting question, which is, do you know how serious COVID is right now? Either of the hospital representatives, how serious is COVID at this point? I I would say pretty serious. Um, we we all have to take it pretty seriously, so we can help protect each other. I'm going to put my regular mask on now. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I, I would, I, I think it's very serious. Um, and that's kind of why we're all doing, wearing our masks um, whenever we come in contact with people so we can protect each other. Okay. You want to keep these. Okay. All right. Thank there you we go. so much. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so we showed you how we protect ourselves. So now we're gonna learn how you can protect yourselves from COVID, okay? So the first thing we're gonna look at is what we call social distancing. Have you guys heard of that before? Okay, so how do you guys social distance? Let's get some ideas in the chat. Yeah, I'll show you. Six feet. There you go. Six feet apart. Excellent. And how do you know how to measure six feet? Isn't that hard to measure? How do you know how much six feet is? So let me show you a little trick that we use to know how much six feet actually is, okay? So I'm going to have Dr. Bradford help me. So can everybody stretch out their hand like this? All right. And she's going to stretch out her hand as well. We're not going to touch each other. Okay. <laughs> so that's an easy way to know um, in terms of social distancing. The other thing we're going to learn about is washing your hands. So do you guys know how long you're supposed to wash your hands for? All right, so lots of answers there. So it's actually two minutes. So I'm going to show you a trick to know how you know two minutes. Does everybody know the happy birthday song? All right, so you guys are going to help me sing happy birthday, and we have to sing it two times so that we get to two minutes, okay? So Dr. Angie's going to help me as well, and I'm going to show, we're going to do this for two minutes, okay? Happy birthday to you. 
outside and you see that little picture up there what is that guy doing in the, the top corner what's that guy doing yeah he's covering his cough and sneeze so you don't want to be coughing on each other so you know cough into your sneeze yes covering his cough excellent and then the other lady there in the little bottom corner she's avoiding her her mouth and nose. We don't want to be touching our faces because we usually love to, you know, hug and kiss each other because we love each other. But in the time of a pandemic, we really don't want to do that, okay? What questions do you guys have? So the big question that I've seen a couple times, two times at least, is they want to know if it's safe to go trick or treating. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so I heard that the CDC is saying that it may not be the safest thing to do this year since you're passing objects from one person to the other. So in that way, the virus could spread. So that might be a tough year for trick-or-treating. And I got one more medical question. Um, what percentage of positive cases have symptoms? Because we hear a lot about asymptomatic cases. Mm, that's a really good question. We don't know all of the people who are positive because not everybody gets tested. So it's kind of difficult to know the answer to that. Okay, that's fair enough. And I think timing wise, that brings us to our poll session for questions for you guys. Please answer the questions. So we will be looking into how can you protect yourself and your family from COVID? And um, we also would like to know from you guys, should healthcare workers use goggles to protect their eyes when they're seeing a patient? And also, should healthcare workers wash their hands when seeing patients? Another question is, if you're falling ill, who should you tell? And another question is, how many times do you sing a happy birthday song when washing your hands? All right, I see the answers flying in here. All right, how can you protect yourself from COVID? All right, someone thinks wearing a mask. I think that's a really good idea. We just saw that. And then we have cover your mouth when you cough and sneeze. That's true too. Wash your hands regularly or all of them. Yeah, I think that's right. Is that right, Dr. Simone? Okay. How about should healthcare workers use goggles to protect their eyes when they see patients? Yes, we just saw that. You guys are right. All right, should healthcare workers wash their hands when seeing patients? I think we all want you guys to wash your hands when you see us. So please keep doing that. And then if you're ill, who should you tell? A parent, a doctor, a teacher, or all of the above? So what do you guys have to say about that? Is that right, all of the above? Yeah, I think it's fair to let everybody know. Um, so there we go. 
And how many times should you sing the happy birthday song when washing your hands? Two times, that's right, we just did that. Okay, you guys are awesome, you're paying great attention. Thank you so much. And that brings us to talking to Mr. Antoine. Mr. Antoine is uh, something super exciting. He is a respiratory uh, therapist. And my first question to you is, what is a respiratory therapist? Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you all for uh, having me. Uh, so a respiratory therapist is a, a therapist who takes care of the lungs. So our, we uh, go to school and learn about the heart and lungs and we take care of patients who have asthma and who have any other lung issues. Um, and COVID has, has put us kind of at the forefront just because we've taken care of, of so many patients who have been very, very sick with, with severe, or really, really bad lung issues. Um, I did wanna show really quickly a cool uh, PPE that we have um, that I know they use at TMH uh, as well, but it's a PAPR. So it looks a little bit different from the device that they just used. Um, it'll take all of two seconds because I have a beard and it's hard for me to get a tight seal on the type of mask that Dr. Uh, Simone just showed you. I use a different type of mask. So what I have is a mask that goes over the top of my head like this. Want one, one of those. <laughs> so cool, I want one. And I turn it on, and it's, I don't know if you can hear me because now I have air rushing by my ears, but it's a, a, a different type of mask that keeps me safe when I'm taking care of COVID patients. So it's pretty cool because it allows me to not have any, you can read my lips and everything, and it, it keeps me safe from COVID patients. This is something that we use here at at Capital Regional, and they have similar devices over at Tallahassee Memorial as well. So it's just another way that we as healthcare professionals take care of, of COVID patients. And it makes us look really cool when we're walking in the room. It's called a PAPR. So a positive air, respir positive air powered respirator. Popper. Yeah, Anton, no joke, everybody wants one. I'm gonna get in line to get one too. That is the coolest thing I've seen all day. So it, it's pretty cool. We just have to make sure we swap out the batteries as we use it. But uh, for, for us guys who, who didn't want to lose our beard, that was our other option. That to, is to exciting. Take care of patients. Um, so some of the things that respiratory therapists do uh, is we help people breathe. So with the COVID has made it where some people, their lungs are damaged and hurt so bad that they can't breathe. And we as respiratory therapists put them on a mechanical ventilator. Uh, sometimes people call it life support, uh, but it is a, a ventilator to help them breathe when they can no longer breathe for themselves. And once, that, once we uh, put a patient on that, the respiratory therapist and the doctors will help to take care of that patient and help them to breathe until their lungs heal and get a little bit better so that they can breathe on their own. Um, I do have uh, a picture, if, if I can share my screen, uh, so that I can show what healthy lungs look like, and then we can look at what COVID lungs look like. So I'm going to go to that. I'll share my screen here, and um, just give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Just a second. There you go. Can everybody see my screen now? We see Perfect. it, and I see a number of people that are going to put this on their Christmas list. They want that helmet still. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a that's a hospital thing. That one's not. I don't think that one's sold uh, on Amazon too many times. But <laughs> so what I should what I'm showing on the screen is a fairly normal uh, X-ray, and this is what the respiratory therapists and our our doctors uh, look at when we're looking to see what's going on with people's lungs. And what we see here is a fairly good chest x-ray. And this shows the, you can see the lungs on either side. You can see the heart is there in the middle, the big circle that's kind of there in the middle of the chest. And this is what we say is a good 
chest x-ray. This means that the patient isn't having any trouble breathing and that their lungs are working like they're supposed to. So I'll show you what a bad chest x-ray looks like. Antoine, as you're changing pictures, how many respiratory therapists are there in your uh, hospital? I have 24 respiratory therapists on staff here. Um, so not a huge uh, bunch here at uh, the other hospital. They have 97 respiratory therapists because it's a much larger hospital. So uh, in the city altogether, we have about 130 respiratory therapists. There are about 11,000 in the state of Florida. So. We're, we're a small but, but mighty group. Um, and, and what you're seeing on the screen now, you can see how it's a lot more junky and you don't see as much going on. All of the stuff that's white, it shows where there's a lot of fluid and bad stuff in the lungs. So these are some of the things that the respiratory therapists work with the doctors and that's what we use to take care of our patients. Um, I do want to show you one of the cool things that's right there in the middle of the screen, which is hard for people to see. I'm going to stop sharing my screen there, is the ET tube. So I want to go over one or two of the cool little toys that we use to put patients on ventilators. And um, one of them is an ET tube. So this is the tube that we use, and it goes into the mouth. And this is how we put people on, on ventilators. And it's something that we do when people are, their lungs are really, really bad off and, and they need help breathing on their own. And we make sure that they're very comfortable and the doctors take really good care of them to make sure they don't feel anything. Um, but we do that when people get really, really sick until their lungs can work a lot better and they can breathe on their own. So respiratory therapists are, are always there taking care of patients who, who can't breathe and who need help with their lungs until their lungs get a little bit better. There was one question in the chat that said, do you see all COVID patients? We do, we see, well, I won't say we see all of them. We see about, if we had, we see about nine out of 10, I'll say that. So we see almost all of them because the, the virus really affects your lungs. So a lot of them have trouble breathing, it, or they need oxygen to breathe, and that's when uh, the respiratory therapist comes in and helps them with that. So we see almost all of the COVID patients that come into the hospital. And there's another really uh, good question, which is how do you eat if you have a tube in your mouth? That's a great question. So you can't. You cannot eat when there is a tube in your mouth. Uh, we have to go through other options to whether it's, it's giving you a, a tube that goes down into your stomach or uh, before we do that, they can give you uh, a, a IV that gives you fluid that can help you to sustain or to keep you going if you're only going to be on the ventilator for, for a couple of days. Um, but no, you cannot eat when you're on a ventilator uh, just because that, that tube is kind of blocking it there. So no eating, no talking. Um, none of that until your lungs get a little bit better. Someone says, no pizza, and what is an IV? Oh, an IV is a little tube that goes into your arm, um, and we can draw blood from it, or we can give you medication through it. And so if you go to the doctor and you get a shot, um, think of that shot without the needle part. There's a little plastic piece that stays in your, your arm, and that's how they can give you medications and they can draw blood to make sure that everything we're doing is working. Okay. Oh, that is exciting. Thank you so much. Um, I'll pick it back up here. Well, and actually, hold on, Antoine, before you go, I've got a question here that I don't know the answer to. Uh, I think it's a good one. Are there lung diseases that can't be seen through an x-ray? That is very good, yes there are a, a good amount of, of lung diseases that can't be seen through x-ray. There are some other, other ways to look at them. We have different types of scans. So you can do a, a CAT scan or you can do an MRI, but there are, there's a, a, an amount of respiratory diseases um, that you can't see on a, a chest x-ray just because it's only one type of, of view. And I would actually defer to, to uh, Dr. Simone to kind of go into that a little bit further if she'd like, but 
there's a good amount of, of respiratory diseases that you cannot see on chest x-ray. Okay. So there are a lot of diseases that you can't see on an x-ray. So we rely on, as Antoine said, we can rely on something like a CT scan, we rely on MRIs, we rely on other different types of um, imaging to see those as well. Okay. Exciting. You can't see on any of those tests, but if you, so there's other kinds of tests that we can do that tell what those, those kinds of diseases. Thank you, that's awesome. All right, I will share my screen again. Can you guys see on your see this okay? All right, and that brings us to meeting a NAC lab scientist. We also have Dr. Sam Grant with us, and um, take it away, Sam. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm one of the many researchers that works at the MAG lab. And we use the um, high magnetic fields here um, to do a lot of different things. Some of us look at materials, some of us look at biological problems. I'm one of the ones that, look at that looks at biological problems, so I wanted to show you some of the imaging that we do. This is actually inside of my head. This is a picture of my brain. It's taken at three tesla. Three tesla is the strength of the magnetic field, which is many, many, many times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field or the uh, the refrigerator magnets that you have. And this is basically an example of an MRI image. It's a magnetic resonance imaging technique that uses magnetic fields in order to look at the water distribution in the brain. So we can see different areas um, and we can look at the anatomy of the, uh, of the brain um, uh, in a lot of detail. Uh, if we go to the next image, um, that's the next slide is one that is not um, an MRI, but a CT. Um, so if, here we go, okay. And this now is, uh, CT stands for computed tomography, and it's effectively a 3D X-ray that gives you um, uh, information in all three planes, X, Y, and Z. And what you see here in the middle, um, maybe you can tell me what that is. Um, what is that, that structure that's in the middle of the, uh, of the image? Anybody know? Very good, that's right, it's the heart. And so it's labeled here with the uh, right atria, the left atria, the right ventricle, uh, the aorta. And these are, these are basically, um, uh, this is the pump that's pushing blood through your body. And around the heart, you can see the lungs. This is a picture um, from the web of someone who has a normal appearing lungs. So effectively a healthy person with no real damage due to any type of disease, okay? If we go to the next image, now you can see uh, effectively uh, what a, uh, a 3D CT image looks like from a COVID patient. And in this case, now towards the bottom of the lungs or the bottom of the image, you can start to see uh, the type of infection and the type of damage that the virus does to the lungs. So they're no longer clear, they're no longer black, and you can start to see um, uh, what's actually happening. And this is starting to affect how a um, how the lungs are working, how we breathe, and, and how well we can then distribute um, oxygen to the rest of the body. So this is a big concern, obviously, with COVID patients, and it, it's one of the, the principal reasons why um, uh, this disease is, is so serious and, and so damaging. Okay? If we go to the next slide, we see that same picture again, but we can also look at the same patient, and we can look at their brain. And in this case, this is an MRI scan, in which um, the little white arrows that you can see are pointing to little white dots that are in the brain. And these are actually little points of ischemic stroke. So these are areas where there have been blood clots or emboli that have um, developed in the brain and it's actually causing a disruption in the blood flow to the brain, which means the blood's not able to carry oxygen and glucose to the brain. So the cells that are in those areas start to die and it affects effectively the way that uh, uh, COVID patients think, the way that they um, uh, have balance uh, depends on where these little strokes happen. And that's a very serious thing as well. And that's one of the other aspects of, of uh, and, and it's very unfortunate as, aspects of COVID-19 is that it affects not only the lungs, but also other systems in the body. 
And that uh, makes it a, a very damaging type of disease. If we go to the next image, you can see it can actually get fairly severe. And there are some um, fairly large areas where there's been quite a bit of damage in different parts of the brain, where it's really affected a lot of the structures um, uh, on the image that's on the left-hand side. And it can even uh, uh, affect big areas of the brain, like the white matter tracts that you can see in the right image of the brain. It also causes these little dots in the brain that the white arrows are pointing to that are called microhemorrhages. And these are areas where basically the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the brain are leaking. Um, and that's causing problems again with blood flow into these areas. So my interest in, in COVID and the way that I've studied some of the diseases that I look at is by figuring out ways to try to treat these, these stroke conditions. So if you go to the next image, you can see some of the work that we do um, at the College of Engineering and at the Mag Lab. And that's where we use adult um, stem cell therapy, um, particularly mesenchymal stem cells, um, that um, are um, uh, allowed to effectively, uh, we inject them into the vasculature, and then they migrate um, to different areas uh, in the brain, and they actually help to secrete materials in the brain that are um, uh, helpful in basically repairing um, those structures, restoring blood flow, and um, producing a, an inflammatory response. Uh, that's moderated in some fashion. So in this case, this little animation here shows um, our uh, adult stem cells migrating to the area of the stroke. They're releasing materials that basically affect the blood vessels to open them up or generate new blood vessels to increase blood uh, flow. Uh, they're restoring um, uh, and regenerating neurons that are in the brain. And they're also um, having an immune response by um, affecting macrophage action in the brain. So those are the, the um, uh, cells that are kind of sweeping out other particles um, uh, in the tissue. And hopefully we re can restore the, uh, uh, the tissue to something that approximates normal function. If you go to the next slide, um, and while we're doing that, I can, ask a, uh, I can answer a question about mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are cells that are found in bone marrow and adipose tissue, so they're effectively precursor cells that develop into fat but they also have a lot of nice properties. They secrete materials, um, cytokines and things that actually help to regenerate tissue, um, to make new cells, and help to do things like grow new blood vessels and to protect the body in different, uh, in different regions. So when we um, uh, do our studies, we don't use humans because we're at very high fields and we're using um, uh, magnets that have very small bores, so we can't fit a human inside them but we can go up to um, fields that allow us to get higher resolution, kind of like high definition, and also allow us to look at other types of things besides the water distribution. So one of the magnets that I use and, and my students use is this 21 Tesla magnet um, that's at the maglev. And that's now seven times higher than what a human um, uh, would usually receive uh, in a hospital um, as far as an MRI scan. So we can take water-based images, which you can see in the middle, the red circles here um, are, are, uh, are circling basically stroked areas in a rat brain. This rat's alive and we're trying to treat, uh, treat that, um, uh, that stroke in that rat with uh, these mesenchymal stem cells. Um, the middle images are actually tracking the cells, which we labeled with a particular contrast agent. And then the images that are over on the right-hand side are actually sodium images. So this is the case where we're now looking at the sodium in the brain in order to look to see how those cells are recovering uh, the ability to control the distribution of sodium inside and outside of the cell. And for us, this is a really good way of monitoring how functional cells are and if they're starting to record that, re recover that function. And our therapies actually help to recover the, the functionality of the brain much more effectively than other techniques. So that's one of the things that we can look at very uniquely because we're at such high fields. If we go to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple of the other research projects that are ongoing at the MAGLAB that are really very much directed at COVID-19. Um, first, we have researchers, particularly in chemistry, um, like Dr. Um, Tim Cross, who is looking at different parts of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. That's the virus that causes um, uh, COVID-19, um, so that we can better understand its structure. And if we can understand the structure, we can hopefully help people figure out exactly how to defeat it. Um, 
I, working with a, a, a collaborator that's at the College of Engineering, um, are looking at monoclonal antibodies. Uh, these are uh, potential vaccines and how they um, uh, could possibly be used to treat COVID patients. In particular, um, my collaborator, whose name is um, Hadi Mohamed is uh, we're looking at basically how those monoclonal antibodies can be delivered and um, how effectively their structure can be changed if they're put into an IV bag or if they're put into a syringe. Um, so we want to maintain the, the functionality of these vaccines and we're looking at ways to hopefully um, improve that. And then with researchers um, and collaborators that I have at the College of Medicine, uh, we're also looking at mesenchymal stem cells as a way to produce what are called extracellular vesicles. And these are little spheres, very small spheres, um, that uh, we can modify and actually incorporate what's called the ACE2 receptor. This is the receptor that the, the COVID virus grabs onto and gains entry into the cells. And what we're hoping is that these vesicles can actually be used as little sponges so that if we put these into the bloodstream, they will actually help to um, collect the viruses so that they can't attach to cells. So these are a, a, a lot of different things that, that we're looking at and as a lot of other researchers, both here and at other um, institutions are looking at to try to help understand the disease, but also try to figure out ways to improve the delivery of a vaccine, as well as um, possibly other ways of, of um, if not curing the disease, at least making it easier for patients to recover. Okay, well that was a lot of information and um, that's what the Mag Lab is doing to work uh, towards helping the situation that we're all in. So, um, I've got questions for Dr. Grant. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. First one, um, if you know, will a vaccine be as effective, the same or weaker than natural antibodies if you have caught COVID naturally? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So I'll, I'll first say that the most effective thing that you can do is what the, the, the doctors and, and other folks from TMH and the respiratory clinic discuss, and that's really again, protect yourself by social distancing and wearing masks and things like that, that's actually going to be even more effective than a vaccine. Um, as far as natural antibodies and, and a vaccine, it's a really good question and nobody really knows the answer. We don't even know if you um, are infected with um, the, uh, the coronavirus, if you're going to be susceptible again to another reinfection. Viruses change really quickly. Um, and it's possible that um, once you're infected, you might be immune, but it's also possible that um, that virus changes and you might be able to get sick again. So it's very important to make sure that you um, to use proper um, social distancing, wear a mask and take care of yourselves by hand washing and things like that. The next question is, when you get COVID, what needs more care? Is it the organs in the chest or is it the brain? I think definitely, and, and, and the folks from TMH and, and the clinic can, can probably comment on this, the first thing is probably going to be the, uh, the respiratory system, because that's where it really attacks um, uh, uh, initially. But the respiratory system is hooked into everything else, into the cardiovascular system, the bloodstream, the heart, and that then is every, uh, distributes to every other system in the body. So if there's an effect there, it tends to affect other areas and other organs as well. So it's a big concern along, uh, down the road as well of, of even people who recover from the virus if they're going to have deficits or other effects later in life. All right, one more. Is there any evidence that a small viral load, a small amount of exposure to the virus, can help someone develop antibodies without getting sick to the point of showing symptoms? Um, I, I, I defer to the, the physicians, but uh, effectively, it is possible that that happens, but I don't think that anyone knows, particularly with this novel coronavirus. Other viruses in the past have um, been able to do that, and there are, are such things as live virus vaccines, uh, but it's not often used. Um, and uh, in this particular case, it's something that researchers really don't know the answer to yet. All right, and one more that just came in. Um, is COVID-19 changing? Uh, yes, it is. Actually, there are different types of uh, viruses that have been studied and have been identified. 
Um, so it's not just one virus. Uh, there are um, small changes that are regional and it has evolved. One of the things about viruses is that they take over the, um, uh, the, the actions of the cell to produce lots more viruses, millions and billions of viruses, actually. And as that process goes on, the viruses change a little bit. They mutate. They become slightly different. Um, so that does happen. It's like the flu virus, for example. The flu virus is never the same virus from year to year. It changes and it mutates and it, it becomes different. And that's one of the reasons why we have difficulty with flu of building up immunity. We hope that that's not the case with the COVID virus. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam. And um, I would say we save all the other questions for all the other uh, guests we have for the end and move on because I know there's probably some of us that are looking forward to get their dinner as well. So that brings us to doing some hands-on science. As you know, when we meet at the library, we always do an experiment together. And this time I brought you an experiment that you can do at home uh, with your siblings, with your friends, with your parents, with your guardians. All you need is a soup bowl or a soup dish. Any bowl really will do. About two cups of water, um, pepper, and soap. Any soap really works, shampoo, liquid soap works really well. And here's what I would like you guys to try out. All right, we're gonna put some water in the dish and then put pepper um, in the water. And then I want you to stick your finger in there. And when you pull it back out, you're gonna have some pepper on your finger. And the pepper in this experiment really is a symbol for virus particles. So now we'll put some soap on our hands and we'll put the finger in the water. And if you now look at your finger, you won't be able to see any pepper particles or any virus particles on your finger. I encourage you guys to try this out um, it really shows nicely how much soap and washing your hands can do for you in removing particles off of your hands. So please go ahead, try that out. At the beginning, we had a bunch of good questions. What kind of soap to use? What kind of soap works really well? As Carlos pointed out, that's a really good experiment to try out. Try different soaps. Try to see what happens. Experiment with this and uh, let us know how it goes. I get so many students coming up to me asking about um, science projects and what they should do and what they need to do for science fair. Yulia just showed you a really cool demo that you all can do at home. And by changing something and seeing how it reacts, you've got a science fair project. You can change the type of soap. You can change the liquid. Maybe use some rubbing alcohol or cooking oil or uh, vinegar and see if that affects the, um, the, the demonstration. So it's, it's a lot of different things that you can do. Instead of pepper, maybe you can use salt or paprika or any number of things. I mean, this is the whole point where science gets to be fun. You see something and you start asking, well, what happens if I, and then you're doing science. Um, you, if you repeat those steps, I want you to repeat the steps, please. All right, let's do that. Okay, so we have a dish. We put some water in it. And then first, we put some pepper on top of the water. Um, and then you'll take your finger. Here comes the finger and you stick it in the water. And you have a look. Hey, there is stuff stuck on my finger. Okay, you clean off your finger. And you go ahead and you put some soap on it. And then you stick your finger in the water again. All right, we encourage you to try this out at home. As always, let us know how it's going. Our email address will be at the end of this presentation as well. We'd love to see pictures, videos, send it in. And that brings us to Ms. Casey from the library. Wasn't that such a cool experiment? I just loved when all the pepper like left the bowl or went to the outsides of the bowl when you put your soap on your finger. 
Um, if you want more books about science experiments, you can find those at the library. You can ask us. You can give us a call or come into the library. We also are giving out free masks as well, which a lot of the doctors talked about this evening. And I also have a couple of books that I recommend for you this week. This one's called Viruses Up Close, which gets more in depth about what some of the doctors talked about tonight. It talks about how big a virus is and the and the germs and it also comes back to vaccines and things like that and how we treat the viruses so that's viruses up close there is also a list here on your screen and then i have a couple about germs picture books about germs i have a chew the most interesting book you'll ever read about germs and i have i know how we fight germs so those are two fun picture books for the younger crowd as well. If you have any questions, just let us know. Again, I'm Miss Casey, and I can type my um, contact information in the chat for you. Miss Casey, I've got a book recommendation. Um, I picked up a book at a science conference called um, Do Not Lick This Book, and it's all about microbes and my yes. son. I'm going to embarrass him. He's not here. He is terrified of the book because he knows that, you know, it talks about putting your finger in and you're picking up microbes and he's terrified that there's actual microbes in the book that are going to him, so. Oh, no, it, yeah, no, it's a fun book. Awesome. I read it with my preschoolers and they love it too, so. If you wanna find Miss Casey's book list, you can go to our website, the MagLab website. Uh, the link is here, but it's also super easy to find. If you go to Google or your favorite search engine and you type in MagLab Science Night, it's going to be your first hit at the top. This will take you to our website. And then for the October event, we'll have Miss Casey's book list. And if you click on it, you'll see it right there. And she even explains to you how to get a library card if you don't have one. All right. Um, this brings us to um, hopefully seeing you next month. We meet again on Zoom on November 19th, and our topic will be lights, and I promise we'll be talking about why the sky is blue. Um, however, we'll also be talking about lots of lights and wavelengths and colors um, because the uh, holiday season is coming up. Um, so join us to learn about that. I also have our Science Night email address. That's where you can um, show us your progress, your experiments. Email us what you have done as an experiment, and we will reward the best results, the best um, experimental setup, and the most creative experimenters with a prize. So we're excited to hear from you guys. Um, at this point, I'll ask all the panelists to turn on their cameras and come online to answer Last questions, if there are any. Carlos, do we have any questions from the audience that are so burning that we can't wait? They are all excited about the experiment. So one more time, make sure you do your experiment. And it doesn't have to be exactly what we do. If you want to put your own twist on it, please, by all means, be creative. Go for it. Send it to us. Send us a picture. Send us a video. Send us a Word document telling us what you did. Send us whatever you can. Science night at magnet.fsu.edu. You can give us our, um, your address, and we are going to send you a prize. Um, one question just came in. How do, you, how do you get scans for a COVID probable patient if a woman is pregnant? Can pregnant women get x-rays or does it hurt the baby? Um, Simone or Antoine, either one of you want to take that? Uh, so pregnant uh, patients can still get chest x-rays. We can place, what we do is place a, a barrier over the patient's stomach to ensure that the baby is not exposed to any radiation. So they put a metal cover over the, the, the stomach to prevent the baby from being harmed. So yes, they get chest x-rays routinely. We try not to unless we actually absolutely have to, but it is done. Fantastic, great answer. Uh, one question just came in, do you always die from a sickness? No, you don't always die from sicknesses. Lots of people recover and there are um, plenty of other uh, reasons for death too. Not to end on a grim note. Um, Yulia, anything else? Um, I just wanted to thank uh, all our guests. Well, Miss Casey is part of the Always crew. Uh, Dr. Sam from the MagLab, thank you. And our two uh, healthcare 
providers, Dr. Simone and respiratory therapist Antoine. Thank you so much for coming on today. And I pass it back to Carlos to close it off. I just want to do a quick reminder that the National, uh, National Magnet Lab is funded by the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida, which makes everyone in the audience stakeholders in our science. And one last note before I say goodbye for tonight, just a reminder, stay nerdy, stay geeky, stay true to who you are, and remember, be nice to others because science is an activity for everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.